Good afternoon. I am Andy Rich. I'm the Dean of the Colin Powell School here at City College. It's our School of Social Sciences. And I want to welcome you to Archaeology and the Making of the American Past, Race, Community, and the Struggle for Social Justice. We are living through an extraordinary moment in the centuries-long struggle for racial and social justice in the United States an anti-racist movement, the largest in the nation's history and the power of which is growing in the wake of police killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Brandon Deontay Roberts, and so many more Black Americans. A movement for civil rights and human rights, police reform and changes in some of the fundamental institutions of our society. We're in the midst of a new reckoning with the political power of Black Americans who in Georgia, and in other states across the country overcame extraordinary but not new anti-democratic efforts to suppress the vote in order to shift political power in Washington, D.C. And in and amid all of this, we are re-examining the history of this nation and the history of slavery, which is in its foundations. Today's discussion takes up these important subjects with an exploration of the role that archaeologists play in analyzing, interpreting, promoting, and protecting sites important to African-American history. We've assembled a panel who recognize that Black and African-American history is fundamentally American history, and they will discuss the role that public education can and should play in engaging communities and understanding the connections between the past and the present. This discussion is part of a growing set of initiatives within the Colin Powell School and across the college to make more explicit and active the connections between our mission and the movements for social and racial justice in this country. For all of its history, CCNY has been a radical and a political institution, a place that for more than a century has been a radical experiment in how to make outstanding higher education available and affordable for all New Yorkers. We're a place that believes in shifting power in our society and in accomplishing that through intellectual honesty and intellectual progress by our faculty and with our students. Today's event is part of that tradition. I want to thank my colleague and friend Herbert Senior A for playing a role in organizing today's event. I want to thank all of the speakers, but Herbert, as, as one of our speakers, I, I, I want to draw special attention because we congratulate Herbert today, because today, this morning, he became an American citizen. So congratulations, Herbert. Herbert is the director of the Colin Powell School's Office of Igna Academic Advising, and he does as much as anyone at the Colin Powell School to not only make sure that our students are supported and succeed in completing their degrees, but also to ensure that we as a school make this a place that helps our students broaden and deepen their understanding of society, of its history, its institutions, its ideas, and the possibilities in order to increase our students' power to make a difference in our world. Archaeology is a big, important part of that, and this discussion a part of that. So Herbert, thank you and congratulations. Um, I also want to just briefly recognize our inaugural class of racial justice fellows. These are students from across City College who have committed themselves to being leaders in anti-racist movements in this city and nationally. We're glad they're here with us today, um, and we congratulate them on being a part of the inaugural class of this important program. It's now my pleasure to turn it over to Professor Matt Riley. Dr. Riley is an assistant professor of anthropology, gender studies, and international studies here at City College and at the CUNY Graduate Center. His archeological research explores issues of race, colonialism, slavery and freedom in the Caribbean and West Africa. He is the author of Archeology span Below the Cliff, Race, Class and Red Legs in Barbadian Sugar Society. Thank you all of you for being with us today. Matt, thanks for organizing today's event and let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Dean Rich. I should first say this was a panel organized very much by Herbert and all of us on the panel together. So it's certainly not my, uh, my initiative. Um, but first to get us started, I do want to acknowledge that we are, uh, given that we're going to be discussing issues related to land, space, and history, we of course at City College are on the traditional lands of the Lenape, stolen lands of the Lenape. And we're in a Harlem community, a, a strong historically black community that's in the midst of um, very severe processes of gentrification. So this is something that will come up throughout our conversation today, but important to acknowledge from the outset. 
I should also add that we do have a hard stop, uh, stop today at about 1.30 so we can pick up the conversation with the racial justice fellows that Dean Rich just mentioned. So for those students out there who wish you could be having these behind the scenes conversations, let this be uh, an inspiration for you to apply for this program for next year. Uh, my role today is an easy one. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here to moderate this conversation uh, between, uh, between such esteemed panelists. So, so you don't have to hear from me. I'm going to quickly introduce our panelists before we can get to our questions for today. First, we have Cynthia Copeland, who is a part-time faculty member and supervising instructor in the Department of Teaching and Learning at the Steinhardt School of Culture, Education, and Human Development at NYU. She also teaches at Bank Street College of Education. As a culturally responsive and social justice educator, public historian, and museum consultant, she serves as an interpretive specialist to diverse cultural and educational institutions and organizations across the United States. In addition to being part of the African Burial Ground Project in the 1990s, Ms. Copeland has curated several critically acclaimed national exhibitions, including Before Central Park, The Life and Death of Seneca Village about a significant 19th century free black community that once stood within a site now known today as Central Park. We'll be hearing a lot more about that in our discussion today. Significantly, and for our purposes in this conversation, Ms. Copeland also co-directed an archeological excavation of the same site in the summer of 2011. Dr. Alexandra Jones is founder and chief executive officer of Archeology span in the Community. Her pioneering work is an, is an as an education leader for more than 16 years is at the intersections of community engaged archaeology, academia, cultural resource management, and public education. She obtained, obtained a BA and MA degrees from Howard University in History and a PhD in Historical Archaeology from the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Jones worked for PBS's television show, Time Team America, as the Archaeology Field School Director, where she directed field seasons for junior high and high school students at each of the sites for the 2013 season. She's also a board member of the Society of Black Archaeologists and currently holds the position of Assistant Professor of Archaeology at Goucher College. Herbert Signore, a familiar face to many of us here in the City College community, is the director of the Colin Powell School's Academic Advising Office. He has worked for over 20 years in the academic setting of CCNY as a program coordinator for two teacher education programs. Herbert is also in a CCNY alum, training in architecture and anthropology during his time as a student. Having undertaken archeological work in New York City throughout the Caribbean, Herbert, along with my predecessor, Professor Diana Wall, has created and helped maintain a vibrant archeological community on our campus. He currently serves as the Associate Director of the Institute for the Exploration of Seneca Village History. This community-based work is the inspiration for the master's thesis project he's currently completing at the CUNY Graduate Center. So welcome to all of our panelists and thank you for being here today to share your wisdom. So I'm going to start us off with a fairly open-ended question where each panelist will have about seven or eight minutes to respond and then we'll have a more informal conversation going back and forth. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to share them in the Q&A function uh, below on your screens. And also I'll be doing my best to share some resources and links in the chat box that correspond to some of the points that our panelists will be raising over the course of our conversation. So to get us started with a more open-ended question, we're at a critical moment in which notions of history, and here I mean the big H history, are being challenged by the left and the right on the political spectrum. In just the last one or two years, we've seen massive public history initiatives like the New York Times' 1619 Project, which was followed by former President Trump's reactionary attempt to implement, quote, patriotic education. These battles are about far more than the facts of history, so to speak. You all wear many hats and work on a number of different projects, but using examples from your own work and experiences, what can public history and community-based archeology span do to push us beyond narrow views of what might constitute American history or black or African-American history? So to start us off, I'd like to invite Cynthia Copeland to join us. Thank you, Matt. Uh, what a great question. Um, when I think about this idea of the work that I've done and the, um, the public, inviting the public, it's so important to share with the public that there is an invitation, that the work that is being done 
uh, as a public historian or uh, uh, public archaeology or any kind of museum work, um, anything that involves sort of interpreting our history, there should be uh, an invitation and it should be sort of this community-based participatory approach, all that kind of work. That's what we believe in. That's what I believe in. That's what the projects that I've worked on believes in as a um, public history in a public history vein. And you know, public historians really need to embrace the idea that there are multi multiple perspectives and that's why you bring the community in and you want to hear what they have to say. And when you do that, it is it becomes part of the essence. It, it's like the vital work of um, the projects that I've worked on. And again, as a public historian and an educator, um, that's what um, I believe in. And you know, when we're thinking about uh, whose history is it? Well, it's everyone's history. And everyone's history, you have to have this sense of history and memory because they both kind of influence each other. And there's this sense that um, when you are looking at uh, the different ways that you invite the voices, you would create this sort of collaborative approach. You're bringing in the individual and the collective memories to try to inform each other, to try to understand how we, the public, take in the information and work to make sense of that information. So, you know, it's, it's a process that, it is a process, and, um, and the work that I've done on the African burial ground out at Weeksville in Brooklyn, um, certainly the Seneca Village project, uh, if I'm doing uh, curating museum ex ex exhibitions that speak to topics where we're trying to investigate the human connection, what is the human spirit, how does that work together, um, how do we look at the um, together uh, the critical analysis of sources, whether it be material culture or um, the um, just speaking with one another. So there's this um, belief that in bringing people together, we remind each other that this business of uh, interpretation, this interpretation business is really, really messy. And, um, but out of the mess, if we learn how to uh, bring in our different disciplinary approaches, if through the anthropologists, the historians, the teachers, the scientists, the religious uh, folks who are involved, all of the parties that are involved together, I think um, if we collectively agree to understand that we all have different understandings of that which we're trying to under interpret, but that we really, um, you know, together can um, come up with some sort of solutions that may not necessarily be right. It's not, we're not going to end up with answers. In fact, we'll probably have more questions, but there's this feeling of out of that sensibility, you gain some respect for one another and a greater appreciation for the fact that these blended memories, these blended stories all uh, can come together for the common good, which is really about interpretation and trying to get a better understanding of, of what it is that we are, are seeking. So um, as uh, sort of the leaders, if you will, of any project such as Herbert or um, uh, Alexandra, myself and you, Matt, if we are sort of leading the charge to gather people together, um, we're trying to help to sort of demystify the processes that we have, the approaches to trying to break down and understand, but share it with the public and really and truly invite um, inquiry, invite all kinds of questions into being, and then um, have people understand that they too have a shared authority and can help to co-direct these projects and these outcomes um, in and of itself. So for example, with the African burial ground, we definitely brought the descendant community into the conversation and they told us how we were going to move through. Of course, you know, there's sort of give and take negotiations that are going on. If you're a little bit more expert in one area versus someone else, 
um, you know, you're going to probably have to uh, have a little bit of uh, an understanding of we can go through this together and let me explain why this could be, but I'm open to your interpretations, your understandings. Um, and so that went on uh, within the community, not so much within sort of the governing groups that were uh, giving a little bit of pushback and resistance as to what was happening. But um, I think as uh, we gain trust in bringing in the community to participate in it. We help them to understand. We listen to one another. We show them what we can learn from source materials. And together they come to learn that and appreciate that history is um, ongoing. It's uh, something that transcends itself as you move from place to place and question to question. You're going to find new information as you go along and that it is this process that we must all stay engaged in, and therefore um, we can try to achieve a common outcome of sorts at the same time sort of going off in our little specialty areas to bring together a bigger and a broader and a more complete story, a more complete interpretation. So I would say that that's sort of my uh, approach. That's what I would offer as um, trying to help people to understand that history belongs to us all. And if we're not working together as a collective, that's when we sort of have these factions and we sort of break things off. And there are these conflicts and these tensions that um, we cannot overcome. There are always going to be tensions, but we have to agree that um, we are trying to, uh, c trying to come to some sort of a, you know, a common good, if you will. So that's what I have to offer. Thank you, Professor Copeland. Next, Dr. Jones, would you like to join us, please? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so in thinking about this question, it, there's a couple of things that come up. Um, first thing is Black history is American history. So um, moving beyond or away from um, this kind of colonized narrative, of what is American history and, and starting to decolonize it in a way that we're very honest about our past and our country. This means talking about the hard topics, federally funded genocide, concentration camps, uh, massacres of union workers, lynchings of Irish, Jewish, Italian and African-Americans in the South. Having these really hard, honest stories and getting away from this romanticization of our history and I think at the point that we start to go uh, that route, what we start to come upon is multiple fields and disciplines are intersecting at the same time. Um, so for me as an archeologist, I specialize in community archeology span and education. So there's multiple different realms in which that, that for me kind of intersects. Um, looking at, for example, um, the Reginald F. Lewis Museum that's opening up. One of the things that makes this museum uh, major, it's, it's an archaeology museum, but it centers the story on the African American experience versus that of the enslaver. So it's taking this landscape traditionally in which uh, people want to highlight, quote unquote, those in power, and it's um, instead centering it on the story of those um, who were enslaved and telling their story in this landscape. Um, instead of uh, those who traditionally are kind of highlighted. So it's things of um, kind of changing what we traditionally have, or we as a country has traditionally put as the focus of things. Um, in addition to that, thinking about our education system and curriculums, oftentimes uh, a lot of the curriculum, the archeology span that is told is centered around quote unquote, large historical, big famous people. Well, if we look at our history, that tends to be the history of white males. So starting to create um, archeology span curriculums that actually focus on indigenous studies, Asian American studies, um, African American uh, studies. So looking at these sites, which put these voices at the forefront. So we're then empowering educators and teachers to be able to tell a complete and full story of African, um, excuse me, of American life when one that doesn't just center one as more important um, than the other. 
Another thing that I tend to uh, think about is how, as archaeologists, do we conduct this work? So for myself, one of the approaches um, I use, and it just it varies from project to project, but is starting with the community. Addressing the community, talking to the community, asking questions of what are you interested in? What can you gain? What would you like to do? How can we uh, help further the goals of the community? And working from that, but also recognizing that I am not uh, the owner of knowledge. There's a joint knowledge production process that is taking place. I am taking all of these phenomenal intellectuals that are already in the community. And we're essentially joining forces in order to promote whether it is uh, correcting social justice wrongs or whether it's um, helping further the story of a particular community or just something as simple as we would just like to know more about this landscape that we, you know, to add to the story that we already do know. Um, it's just coming together and truly collaborating in order for everybody's voice. So looking at a, a polyvocal way of approaching um, how knowledge production is sought, is created, and then disseminated in a way which is equitable um, and also accessible. So when I think about this, for me, it goes back to first uh, decolonizing what traditionally has been our historical narrative and then um, being very equitable and open to and working with all of the members of the community in order to get at what are our end goals and how can my tools of being an archaeologist be used for social justice or be used in a way to advance a cause. Thank you, Dr. Jones. And I now invite Herbert Sr. to join us. Thank you, Matt, and thank you, my fellow panelists. Um, it's a pleasure to be in such a, uh, a company. And in terms of, I'd like to actually acknowledge the work and contribution of the Senegal Village Advisory Board and their director, Professor Emerita from CCNY, Diana Wall, and Nan Rothschild from Columbia, and Associate Director, Mary Flynn. Um, Seneca Village project was lucky enough that we got funding to provide research experience for undergraduates. And I'll actually use one of the quotes from one of our uh, participants, um, Randy Henry. He was a US Army vet and an, actually an immigrant from Antigua. And he said it best when he says uh, he doesn't believe in history of white America, black America, but American history. And we have to see how our history intersects through ethnicity, race, class, gender, and regionally. And historical archaeology has the ability to give voice and history and narratives that have been silenced. Nigerian novelist Chiamanda Adichie has a beautiful tech talk where she explores and exposes the pitfall of a single narrative. We have to look at all sectors of history of our society. The great house and plantation does not exist without the village of the enslaved. If we fail to understand and use a holistic approach, the status quo is maintained. Archaeology is not only about the past, but is also reflective of our present day biases. And a collaborative approach with the community and different sectors of society minimizes that deficiency. The need to engage young students in understanding the processes of how we do that research also. The late Haitian anthropologist, Michel Rautuyo, has an amazing book um, called Silence in the Past, Power and the Production of History. And it looks at the West's failure to acknowledge the Haitian revolution, uh, which is one of the most successful revolutions. And looks at the generation of the history of the Alamo and rule that Columbus placed in American history. And through that narrative, he reveals how power operates in making and recording history. As archeologists and educators, we have to give voice to the rich and divergent history that is American history. And as the previous speakers mentioned, we have to acknowledge and understand that that history is not always pretty. 
through my experience with the African, with Seneca Village, which was an African American and Irish immigrant community, our research through Seneca Village offers a unique lens through which we can explore the lives of African Americans who lived in New York City during the city's capitalist and immigrant expansion in the early 19th century. And traditionally, this has been a period that has been dominated by the analysis of immigrants. And the lives of African Americans and their urban experience has somewhat been silenced. And this research actually gives voice to the urban experience of African Americans. We tend to think of slavery as being a sovereign phenomenon and not realize or not acknowledge that it existed in the North also. And New York was a major center for the enslavement of African Americans. And the African American presence has been in New York from the time that Europeans occupied and displaced Native Americans. Now, if you look at it, um, looking at the archeologists who have done work in New York City, for example, Wall, um, Christopher Matthews and Alice McGovern, um, they note that um, New York City went through major changes during that antebellum period before it emerged as a center of capitalism in the United States. And this change was not limited to the mode of production, but the use of apprentices and enslaved labor in the production and the growth of that immigrant population. And through all that is centering also the issue of race in America. And the Corn Powell School's um, professor emeritus, um, Arthur Spears, notes that America cannot be America without racism. And racism in the United States is, as in all white supremacist societies, is institutionalized and is woven into the fabric of American institutions. And it's diligently maintained by the economic and powerless who profit from it. Um, by trying to understand how this works, we get a better understanding of the processes of society. And archaeology can be a major tool in understanding that. One of the things that we use through Seneca Village is using the public to inform us, so from the advisory board, from the community. But when you do outreach is engaging the public in showing the processes that we go about in understanding that past through the use of primary source documents and archeological research through the material culture and how all this is synthesized in understanding the past. So getting the public engaged in understanding the process and having them be part of the dialogue of how we give voice to communities that have been silenced. Also the importance of forming partnerships that are long lasting. We don't parachute into some into an area and do research and then get out. The research and the dialogue is built out of trust and long-term relationship. Go ahead, Matt. Thank you so much, Herbert. I now enjoy all, I, I now, uh, excuse me, I now invite all three panelists to join me on camera uh, so we can get this conversation flowing in a more kind of informal and open-ended way. I'm already seeing some questions coming in through the Q&A function and I promise we'll do our best to get to these. Um, but first I wanna get us started with a question that was prompted uh, earlier to the panelists but was echoed by a sentiment that was just raised by uh, Gabriel in the chat asking about um, how does that process of involving the community actually play out and what are the steps taken to be inclusive? And to add to that, it kind of speaks to the second question that I had posed to our panelists prior to this event. And it really I, it came to the forefront in all of the responses that we just heard. And it's this notion of the community. It can really be a slippery kind of concept, even though we hear it just about every day in the type of work that's now being done archeologically. And it may not be a bad thing that it's a slippery open-ended concept. It can help foster inclusivity and multi-locality. But how do each of you define community? How is that definition operationalized in your own work? And then finally, how is archaeological knowledge production affected when we prioritize community engagement? 
And given, I, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but Alex, since this is kind of your bread and butter with your organization, hopefully you wouldn't mind getting us started with a response and then we can open it up. Yeah, sure. Uh, woo, very broad question. Um, so for me, it's a couple of things. Each, and I, I want to start with each site, each project is very different. And how this question manifests, manifests different, which each different project. Um, the one thing I will say uh, about any everything is that um, if you look at Black feminist scholarship and anthropology, the way I approach my work is with a sense of care. And what I also say is that I am a teacher through and through. And uh, I get harassed sometimes about it, but when it comes to education and projects, I literally take on my students as if they are my own. Um, so when approaching educational projects, um, I'm looking at what will benefit my students, what will enhance uh, their knowledge, what are the tools they need to produce their own knowledge on their own, um, what do they innately come in with an understanding that I don't know as members of the community that they can in turn impart that knowledge upon me. Um, and then how do I then inspire, influence, and stay a continuing uh, force in their life long after the project is done? Um, and so that, that's one way in which I handle the educational component, but what is the community, who is the community um, varies. Uh, and I can't, uh, in, and I'm stepping out of the educational realm and looking at my research, I have uh, one project, the Gibson Grove, project that I work with. Um, I came in to assist a church years ago. And as a, and this is 12 years ago, as a graduate student who it was new to community and public archaeology, I reached out far and wide. And for me, um, that meant contacting uh, the descendant community, working with the congregation at the church. Um, that meant uh, going a little bit larger and working with the uh, community homeowners community association that meant looking at Maryland as a whole that meant even tapping into the archaeological community for when I needed help in volunteers and thoughts about stuff working with the historical societies um, and then anybody who was just interested in the project um, had that ability and I offered different options and ways for them to be involved with it the other thing is, once that project was done, as most of us, I walked away with a dissertation, but I chose to go far beyond that. I recognized that I took oral interviews from members of that community that are eventually going to perish. I also recognized that my dissertation was the only written information on the African American community at that time because the book that had been written on Cabin John didn't include the African American community. And this is in the 2000s. So I chose to take all of the uh, oral interviews and um, place them in the historic society. So the stories would be forever preserved. It didn't have to do that. Most graduate students aren't thinking that far ahead, but my thought was, how can I give back to this community? So that, that for me was one way to do that. Um, two years ago, the community reached back out to me and asked for help. And for me, as a scholar, you gave so much to me. I am the person I am today because your family, your parents, your cousins, your aunts, your uncles gave their time and their energy to help me uh, do the research to do the study. So the least that I could do is come back to you when you needed uh, my skill set as an archeologist. And so I'm intimately involved in a social justice battle in order to preserve that landscape of the church and a benevolent society cemetery against destruction from the second wave of social injustice. The first wave was done back in the 60s. And now the same institution that did the first wave is now coming back for a second wave and they brought in. So just kind of thinking through community is a very large and can umbrella out very big um, and inviting people to have a seat at the table in order to come up with and discuss. Also recognizing and explaining to all, if everybody is a little uncomfortable, I did my job <laughs> and, and our, our project will be fruitful and we'll have goals, but um, it's very complex 
and complicated. There is no uh, cookie cutter or roadmap in how to do this work. I have to agree with Alexandra. It's, it is an incredible um, uh, experience to try to form a community. Um, sometimes community can be, you know, I mean, I hate to use this word in this kind of heated uh, political environment, but it can be cult-like uh, because you have people who um, follow you along from project to project because they're so invested in the type of work that you are doing. And so you always have those followers who are there behind you and supporting you. And then, um, of course, uh, as one who uh, I think most people, I, I'm big on education. So the education community from the littlest ones to adults and beyond, we um, that is part of the community that you always sort of tend to tap into because the idea is once we find out this information together, we want to share this information. We want to inform and educate and make this um, available because we're so passionate, we're enthusiastic, and we think that this is going to help people to grow and to have a better understanding of the places where they live, the questions that they have about identity and re representation where there wasn't, uh, where it didn't exist before, um, figuring out ways to slip it in, not slip it in, but intentionally make it known in bright neon lights that this thing, this place existed, and these are the people who made it happen, and you need to know who these people are. So you have those folks. Of course, the places that hold the, the gatekeepers that hold the material, um, the, uh, sometimes they don't want you in their house, you know, but sometimes you have to barrel your way in and um, dig through those repositories and turn up every stone that is available. Um, sometimes, um, and then you might be able to persuade them enough because of what you're doing, they finally get it, and then they become a part of the community. Um, even the resistors, the ones who are always going to put those obstacles in your way. If you're in dialogue with them, even if it's a tense relationship, they're part of the community too, whether they choose to admit it or not, they're in, the, in it as well. And so um, it is this, uh, it's organic and it can be really explosive um, and, uh, and it can be um, you know, incredibly vast. Uh, but as I said earlier, People, the stakeholders come with their own agendas. Everybody's got a, some kind of, a, you know, I, what's in it for me? I got to know what's in it for me, right? And so um, you get that, uh, but as we, as the creators and tr trying to sort of shepherd and navigate this herd of cats through the process, um, we have to stay focused on the, you know, keep our eyes on the prize of what this thing is, knowing that we're going to probably end up going down a million rabbit holes and go off in uh, so many different trajectories. But that puzzle, the, the idea of the, the puzzle, that labyrinth, that thing that, um, that's what keeps us motivated. That's what keeps us going because we just keep making these discoveries. And as, um, you know, human beings, who are in concert with one another, um, we are really, we're searching for truth. You know, we want to know what is the truth? What is, what's the story here? And, uh, and you know, and if we're, if we're honest enough, if we're open enough, we can be flexible to know that things are likely to change. Um, and again, welcoming the, um, the so-called difficult history. Well, who's it difficult for is the big question. You know, why is it difficult? You know, it's stuff that we need to address. And race and racism and genderism and all that, you know, all of that stuff, the, the horrors of the ways that we have treated one another um, in the past is, is challenging to get through, but we have to get to it in order to ascend to the next level. So um, that again involves all kinds of community. And as Alex said, it is incredibly complicated and um, there's just far too many players <laughs> in the pot, but um, it's an interesting gumbo for sure. That gumbo is particularly interesting with Seneca Village in that it's a milieu of an African community with an influx of European, Irish, and German, and with 
we tend not to highlight sometimes the, the German presence here, but it, they're here. Um, how we understand that mixture in that part of what becomes New York City. In addition to that, there is within that historical period, there are burial grounds within that community of so there's a community of folks who are buried in that in 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 what was formerly Seneca Village. And how we understand that community in terms of the history and how we communicate our understanding of that with the mix of communities that surround Seneca Village. So on the, uh, if you go further north, it's Harlem. On the west, there's the Upper West Side. So something that's been very important with the project has been having an open house at the end of our field projects where we have the students share their research with the community, but the community is their family, the CCNY um, and different um, educational sources, but the surrounding community of the Upper West Side and Harlem and how we advertise is important, how we get the message out so that when we have an open house, we only we don't want one sector or one folks coming because it's convenient for them to walk out the apartment and walk over the park. Because the park belongs to everybody and it's everyone's history. So the encouragement that's needed to get folks to come and learn about that history is very important. Also, the outreach through to the community through neighborhood libraries and neighborhood um, museums so that we can connect the different dots with Wigsville, with Sandy Ground in Staten Island. Um, these are African communities that had a parallel relationship with Seneca Village and how we understand that period cannot be seen in isolation. So it's important to bring different communities together so we can negotiate and get an understanding of the messiness. It's, it's not a question of you go and dig and everything is clean and dandy. It's complicated. It's going back and forth with certain experts in the field, getting the feedback. Does it correspond to the documentary source? What are the misgivings? And for all that, is building a community that goes forward with an understanding and an empowerment that that history is their history and they have the potential to be experts at some point in understanding that past. So traditionally, there are few minority students who think they can pursue a career in archaeology. And by opening up the possibility that they can do it, um, and you don't have to actually go to Egypt or Africa or the Caribbean to do archaeology. There's archaeology right in New York City. There's archaeology in the South because we have a history here that's complicated, that's unknown. And by empowering the students to see the processes of how you go to the archives, dusty, messy, negotiate with XYZ to get documents which disappear once in a while, conveniently and resurface depending upon who you ask for that document. So all these things, by giving them the tools and the knowledge that they can be experts at some point, it's also building a community of learners that can go out and make a change eventually. And if I can add to that Seneca Village um, project, when we were uh, doing the conducting the uh, uh, excavation in the summer of 2011, which, by the way, is our this is our 10th year anniversary, oh. um, we uh, were we saw Central Park as a lab. It was like the lab school, and so because you have people jogging and on bicycles, and we were out in the field, we intentionally decided that we would have an area where young children could come and help to sift the dirt and uh, be a part of it and just to expose them to the possibility of, you know, hey, maybe you want to try to do something like this when you're older or maybe not, but at least you know what this is, right? And so um, people would come along and just, they would want to know. They were just absolutely intrigued. And uh, the 
students who were part of the experience um, uh, were you know, not necessarily uh, versed in uh, archaeological methods. Um, they came from all different kinds of disciplines, and it was just to be able to, but, but their interest was that this is an interesting story, and I think I want to be a part of this, and I want to learn more about this. And once they came on board and they formed a bond that was that's unshakable. They still keep in touch with one another today, um, even though you know a lot of them have gone off to do lots of different things. But I can recall the moment when we unearthed the sole of a shoe from that was embedded inside the pit. And it was slow. We were looking and they're like, wait, what's that? What's that? And, you know, they weren't sure. And they're like, I think it started. They start to guess right there. What is this thing? And gently pulling it out and recording it. We've got people recording it. And one student was so moved to tears that she was just like, oh, my God, somebody walked up. Somebody's foot was in that shoe. Somebody's this is amazing. And and it just had this. It resonated with all of us. And there was this collective moment of silence in deference to the person whose foot was in that shoe, who had a real personal connection to this story of Seneca Village that once upon a time was a footnote in, you know, a million secondary sources. Um, but nobody bothered to try to go deeper and find out. And because, you know, it was an effort to get to the point to do the excavation. So you can understand why I would stay a footnote in New York City. But um, but once that happened, it really just sort of changed the whole atmosphere and the whole bonding experience. And, um, you know, it was beautiful. And it just kind of it's like it's imprinted in you and you just sort of carry that with you wherever you go. But, um, you know, that sense of community that was built within community, uh, you know, speaks to uh, the various levels that add to the complexity of this thing that we're calling um, community. Cynthia, I think that last point is resonates with a lot of folks who might be here who are archaeologists who are, are or have participated in archaeological work. It's that power of material culture it really stakes a claim or a presence to a reality of a history that may have been forgotten until that particular moment. And I think that resonates quite strongly with a couple of questions and comments that have come in uh, over the last few minutes and relate to a question I want to get to about um, claiming space through archaeology and through some of the work that all three of you have done um, in your own efforts. So and again, I, I'm trying to put together some of the questions that have come in uh, over the last few minutes, but it does resonate with the one uh, question here related to uh, burials and the claim of space and history. So this year marks the 30th anniversary of the rediscovery of New York City's African burial ground. This was a monumental project that lives on in a number of ways in the present. Research associated with Seneca Village and the Gibson Grove community has touched on the significance of African American burial sites in the midst of white supremacist erasure and destruction. Why have cemeteries and sites of burial become battlegrounds for racial heritage that connects past to present? And what role do you think archeologists can and should play in such battles. It's a big question to ask towards the end here, I know. But if anyone wants to jump uh, jump first for this one. I'll, I'll try to be brief uh, since to give everybody time, but um, it's a few things. It's, it's um, when we think of burial grounds, they're sacred spaces. They're, they're spaces that are um, kind of the final moment of honoring all that somebody has given to their time and their journey um, on this earth. In addition to that, we, we all believe in some way that there is a certain amount of just innate respect you give to these, these landscapes. Um, and this crosses most uh, cultures that it's just understood that this is a sacred space. So it's the idea of, someone desecrating it, the idea of somebody violating it, destroying it, um, basically uh, making this person, this group of people, this community obsolete and removing it from history that nudges at the core of us. It's, it's the idea that this too can be us one day that makes it um, such a powerful landscape and one in which we rally around. The 
I think the added to this part is that, especially for marginalized communities, you had someone who lived such a life of uh, struggling and oftentimes fighting in their lived environment that you think they would at least gain peace and death. And so it's this idea that as those living, as those carrying on their legacy, um, we choose to take up the mantle of giving them the honor of allowing them to have this peace and death and, and honoring and keeping sacred uh, this space. And so I think that's why there's so many of these battles being fought around these sacred landscapes. My own actually entry into archeology span comes from the rediscovery of the African burial ground. I was initially doing architecture and then I took up classes in anthropology right at the wrong time that the African burial ground was still rediscovered. And the attempt by the GSC to continue the dehumanization of people of African ancestry in the way they sought to go about their project without respecting the descendant community. But you saw the power of community coming together to give voice to show respect to the ancestors. Luckily, the mayor at the time was African-American, so that contributed and made a difference. If it was somebody else, I would not mention naming names, it might be slightly more revolutionary, but the ability of the establishment and the community coalescing and coming together, even as the GSC attempted to match on with the project. Luckily, again, the chair of the chairman of the wisdom Means community was also African American. So the funding for the project was put on hold until the respect could have been shown to the community. So you see, even in that, the community at the time using attempts to show humanity to their community in the way they bury, they bury the folk. And the link between that community and the descendant community, the need to respect and to humanize them in the way that the research was done and the way the burials were reinterred was something that was very important. Yeah, and in the case of <clears throat> the African burial ground, it was sort of a confluence of, you know, fortunate events that there was so much um, uh, black political power going on at that time in order to um, sort of, you know, have eyes and ears on the ground to see what was happening to use that political power to make demands and commands and to uh, negotiate and work with the federal government. Um, Gus Savage was really, really a major player in trying to move things forward and told the GSA folks that they were just being disrespectful. And he would, you know, hammer the hammer down and say, I'm not talking to you anymore till you get it, get your head on straight and hear what this community is saying. And so there was um, an opportunity. This was a moment where um, black people in New York City were feeling empowered, um, curious that this could have happened, you know, ha incredulous actually, that there could have been a parking lot on top and, you know, poles going through over time. Because the big question is, as you know, we all believe in uh, urban development and we want to see the city change and grow. Uh, but the big question is, is it people? What do we value? People and people in death? or development, buildings that go up, right? And there's this constant uh, state of amnesia, amnesia, New York is in, New York City is in, you know, build it up, take it down, build it up, take it down, don't think about what's beneath the surface. And luckily for this particular project, being federally funded, having to honor the laws that are in place that, okay, we got to see if there's anything of cultural significance, you know, but that wasn't, in that law was relatively new, wasn't that old actually, um, that they would have to, you know, eventually follow that. And so um, I think that these, the, the contested, the idea of contested space through cemeteries is 
benefits, as particularly for people of marginalized, uh, from so-called marginalized communities. Um, you know, as Alex said, this was a, these are sacred spaces. These are also spaces that belonged to the people. This is definitely, they are burying their dead. They are taking care of their people. They are expecting to be able to have this space forever and into perpetuity that you will be able to visit. This belongs to me, you know, to my family. This is going to have legacy. And when that gets um, trashed or is um, compromised in any way, um, it's, 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 it's alarming. And people want to do things. And we recognize that, you know, for the sake of uh, development, things have to be changed and removed and all. Okay, but do it with respect. Respectfully remove the burials to a more appropriate resting place and let us be, let us oversee how you're doing it. We don't expect you to just, you know, dig up and throw someplace where it, where, and say that you're doing this and then not do it. These things have to be done with, again, intentionality. We need watchdogs. Um, we need um, people from the community to oversee that. And it just so happened that the 1990s throughout the country, it seems, you know, burial grounds are starting to pop up all over the place. Like, you know, the spirit, they just want their story told, you know, and you're, you're going to learn this story and we're going to connect the dots throughout this country. And that seemed to have happened. And I think that people were sort of primed for it because there was one, there was two, there was three, there was four, you know. And so uh, people were learning from each rediscovery how did they do it? Okay, so how did they form a group? Okay, so they put this task force together. So, you know, the processes are in place and we can learn from one another by staying tuned to what is happening. And then we can historically preserve, uh, if not the actual land space, landscape space, through some form of pres preservation of marking or, um, you know, some kind of acknowledgement of sorts so that um, if if in the future uh, something digging has to happen, well, you know, there may be a couple of burials that are left behind there, so you shouldn't touch this area at all, you know? So um, there's a lot of that going on. So I'm gonna stop, because I can go on and on. Keeping an eye on time, we only have about a minute left, unfortunately. So a lot of questions have come in. My apologies that we haven't gotten to all of them, but I'm hoping we could end on a note of inspiration. Uh, Tao just asked in the chat, how can we get more people of African descent into archeology? span And we have the pleasure here of having three pioneers in that realm, truly important figures in this sense. And so I'm hoping to connect this to questions that have come in from Shirag and Valerie about decolonizing education and anti-racist curriculum and anti-racist archaeology. So what would be your take-home message, your elevator pitch of sorts, for us to leave with, to think about where we go from here moving forward as a discipline and as an American people in terms of thinking about our history and our collective past? Well, so we just uh, put out, <laughs> um, the SBA did a panel last summer um, on what does archaeology look like in the time of Black Lives Matter. Um, and the actual publication will be out in April, which does that work of talking about what, what does the, what does archaeology have to do, period. But what I would say is there's a number of steps. The first is that we start with education. If the ultimate goal is to bring more people in, we need to start to educate people and actually show them that archaeology does uh, feature people that look like us, meaning everyday normal people. Um, and we do highlight our regular stories. I think that's the most important because oftentimes we've always been fed Egypt or uh, Mexico or my, you know. Um, so I think that's the one big thing. The other thing is we make this a safe space uh, because it, it, it does nothing to bring all of these wonderful, bright scholars into a field that is absolutely toxic. So the other part is for all of us archaeologists that are actually in this room, we really think about what does that look like for us? How do we in turn um, change the way that we've operated or acted? How do we uh, hold our colleagues and the, the system accountable? And that actually often means changing the system and how are we going to actively work in that to make sure and ensure that literally the children that I am training right now <laughs> have a safe space and are able to do this work in the future. 
I would say if you have an activist spirit, archaeology is activism. And it's a way to reimagine a future. It's a way to uh, retell the past. And it gives us hope. And it is empowering. So um, those are messages that I would share with um, students. And I, especially archaeology in the urban landscape is unbelievably fun. It is amazing what you can find and dig up and you know, you walk these streets every day, there's something underneath the ground and it probably connects to your history. So that's what I, as a form of activism, that's what I say. I just want to echo the importance of education in connecting with students and maybe going to the realm or maybe teacher ed programs, um, giving teachers the tools, to understand the power of archeology. span So they pass it on to the students in the classroom. Um, I remember Cynthia had a wonderful program where she would have high school students coming in and have them go through primary source documents and analyze them to understand and comprehend that past. I did guerrilla work in visiting classrooms sometimes with teachers who were excited by the work and it wasn't part of the curriculum, but I would slip in and work with some of the, with, 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 with the classroom, with, with the classroom teachers. I'd be surprised elementary school kids' ability to understand that material. And if you were there in the beginning, one of the slides I showed was from a classroom I worked with almost 20 years ago, I'm not going to say. <laughs> but um, that teacher is actually, actually now a professor. And she was excited by the program and invited me to come to her, her classroom. And I shared the material with her classroom and they created different projects of Pre Central Park, post Central, post, uh, post Seneca Village, and the ability to create and understand that period is, is powerful. So it's never too old to get started. And you know, I know we have to go, but I wanted to say that because of Seneca Village, there is a preschool out in Brooklyn that has named itself Seneca Village for kids. So they're getting that planted in their heads at three, four, five, and six years. So that is amazing, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much to all three of you. It's really been a privilege and pleasure. Uh, it's been so inspiring in a number of ways. Hopefully not so much that tomorrow morning there's holes all over Central Park, um, but hopefully this will inspire the next generation. That's really what all three of you have been doing with the incredible activism archaeology that you've been doing over the years. So thank you to all our panelists. Thank you to the Colin Powell School and thank you so much to our audience. Again, we'll be stopping the event now so we can join a more intimate conversation with the Racial Justice Fellows at the Colin Powell School. But please keep a lookout for future events related to the, the types of themes that we've been discussing here. Enjoy the beautiful day that we have out here in New York City and hopefully see you for the next event. Thank you again for being with us.